There has been in recent years a real reawakening of interest in, in, in capital. Uh, it's true, that's true among um, academic Marxists, if you like, but it's true on a much broader scale. Um, for example, David Harvey has now produced two books of commentaries on the, it's the first two volumes of Marx's Capital, which have been very successful, but which are an offshoot from the video lectures he does on Marx's Capital, which have an enormous audience. You have a whole number of other Marxist writers who've also written important works on capital. But even close to the mainstream, I think that you have often sort of indirect and grudging acknowledgements of the importance of capital. What, what has been the, you know, the most uh, widely discussed bestseller of 2014? A very long a book by an obscure French economist uh, called Capital in the 21st Century, which is an attempt essentially within the framework of bourgeois economics to explain why we're experiencing such a growth in inequality. And the fact that Piketty, I think rather vainly, calls his book Capital in the 21st Century is, uh, Im implies that he's trying to match uh, and improve on what Marx did in the, uh, in the, in the 19th century. That's, that's a tribute. Um, why is there this uh, such great interest in, in capital? Because over the last 15 years, we've seen a growing contestation of capitalism, starting with the protests in Seattle in 1999, but greatly reinforced by the, e the impact of the economic crisis. And whereas people initially with the development of the, the anti-globalization or movement or whatever you want to call it, um, of were attracted to quite superficial criticisms of capitalism, that the problem was a particular, I don't know, mode of regulation, particular institutions or policies. Uh, as things have gone on, here we are in the, what is it? It'll soon be the, the eighth year of what, uh, what Michael Roberts likes to call the, the, long, the long depression. Um, it's become clear that we need... Uh, a more profound, a more thorough, a more radical analysis of what's going on. And that has ri revived interest in Marx's critique of political, political economy. Now, my book uh, is an intervention in that debate. And it's an intervention, however, that takes a very particular position. First of all, politically, it's, it's written from what I think I can claim... Um, without being trying to match Piketty in vainglory, um, it's written from the political perspective that Marx had. It, in other words, it's written from a revolutionary socialist perspective. Um, and of course, we should never, although I'm not going to talk about Marx's politics particular, here, particularly in this, in this introduction, and I don't talk about his politics hugely in the book itself, it should never be forgotten that Marx looks at capitalism from the perspective of, it, of its destruction, its overthrow by the work, working class. Secondly, and closely related to that, and this is something that I want to come back to, um, in, in the book I uh, stress the importance of one of Marx's fundamental ideas that capital has to be understood as a social relationship. And um, that's, I think, crucial to understanding what Marx is about, but it's something that gets lost in a lot of um, discussion on the left, let alone any, anywhere else. Thirdly, and more specifically, because it's a, it's a long book, so, you know, and it doesn't take that long to say capital is a, is a so social relation. Um, uh, in, in my book, um, what I particularly try to do is to understand the development of Marx's analysis um, through looking at the kind of problems that he was trying to address and the particular methods that he developed in order to, in order to over overcome them. Now, it's, it's become much easier to do that because it's always been clear that capital was a work in progress. Marx only published the first volume in his lifetime. He left it unfinished, 
It was his great friend Frederick Engels who um, edited the second and third volumes uh, and published them in the 1880s and 1890s. The, the, even the, in the published edition of Capital, Volume 3, three it breaks off in mid-sentence. This is an unfinished work, but it's not simply an unfinished work. It's an unfinished work that was part of a much longer work in progress that starts in the summer of 1857 when confronted with the development of a global economic and financial crisis, Marx resumes his economic studies, writes one great manuscript, the Grundrisse, um, and then in the process of trying to prepare it for publication, he was not, not good at finishing things, Marx, um, he produced an even bigger manuscript uh, which has only been relatively recently published, the 1861-63 manuscript, and then out of, from that he, he wrote what eventually became the three volumes of, of Capital. But so we see, we see Marx, you can now, tr- because all these have been published, but, and because there's this huge uh, ent- uh, scholarly enterprise, the, the mega, the Marx-Engels, Gesamtausgabe, the Marx-Engels complete works that is progressively publishing everything that Marx and Engels wrote uh, in in Berlin, um, we're in a position to to be able to trace quite closely, to track the process through which Marx developed his ideas. Now, in one sense, it's fantastic to have all these manuscripts, but in another sense, it can lead to um, a collapse into what one might call philological antiquarianism. In other words, all you want to talk about is, well, there's, you know, Marx says X uh, in this manuscript and he changes it to Y in this manuscript. And just because of the scale, the volume of all, all he wrote, um, it, the, the work itself can seem to disappear into a series of often quite chaotic manuscripts. And one of the things I insist on in my book is that although you know, Marx is puzzled by all sorts of things and one reason why his manuscripts are so long is because he thinks he uses his pen to do his thinking. He works out problems by writing about them and not just trying to develop his analysis but also he does endless sums. There's endless arithmetic as he's trying to solve different different problems and that gets him for various reasons into quite a lot, quite a lot of quite a lot of difficulties. You, but despite uh, the, the, the this this endless struggle to overcome um, different different problems, which Marx doesn't always always succeed in, there's a coherence to what he's doing that develops and becomes stronger over time. So I would say, I mean, there, there's a t- tendency among left intellectuals to say. The Grundrisse is really where Marx's best work is, and Capital is, you know, a more uh, dry and scientific work. It's economistic, and so all, all sorts of things, things like that. I think we can see a real progress that goes on through the successive drafts as, as Marx acquires a greater clarity. One reason why he never finished the book, was he was trying, constantly trying to improve the analysis further. He wasn't satisfied by the fact that Capital Volume 1, which he published, was focused mainly on Britain. He became more and more interested in the United States. The United States was the China of the late 19th century, the great new power emerging out of a massive industrial revolution, generating all sorts of financial instability, and Marx becomes increasingly fascinating with the U.S. and tries to understand more about it, and that is one of the factors that leads to the works in, in completion. But there's a, a co- greater coherence and depth to the analysis that, go, uh, that we see going on as time goes on. Okay, well, so I said, I said that in the book I try to address the problems with which Marx is grappling and trying to overcome. So what is, you know, if there's one big problem that he's trying to overcome... What is it? I would say it's that he's trying to grasp the dynamics of capitalism as an economic system, a historically specific and limited economic system, um, what he calls in capital the economic law of motion of modern society. But he's trying to do it by both building on and going beyond the most advanced forms of bourgeois thought. 
In other words, Marx doesn't think that he can just, you know, come and purely out of his own brain solve the problem of the dynamics of capitalism. He draws heavily on his predecessors, even though his predecessors' understanding of capitalism is limited by their commit- ultimate commitment to bourgeois society. So who are, the t- who are the most advanced bourgeois thinkers that Marx draws on? Two, the British um, political economist David Ricardo and the German philosopher Friedrich Hegel. These are the two crucial reference points. What, there's a great passage in Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks where he says that Marx equals Hegel plus Ricardo. And as a formula, in terms of understanding what Marx is doing intellectually, that's absolute, absolutely right. And I want to say a little about what's involved in that because that's really the heart of the book, the Marx's um, struggle with struggles with both Ricardo and, and Hegel. And the starting point has to be Ricardo, because Ricardo represents the high point of what Marx calls classical political economy. Classical political economy for Marx is that strand in bourgeois economic thinking that develops in the late um, 18th and early 19th century, which goes as far as it is possible while accepting um, fundamentally the premises of capitalist society to understand the dynamics of capitalism as an economic system. And it's Ricardo who goes, goes furthest in, in, in that. Um, there's a great passage. The, the, um, Thomas de Quincey was a, an early 19th century writer. He's most famous for a book called Confessions of an Opium Eater. Um, and he spent a certain amount of his time on heroin. And he describes, you know, he's deep in... Deep in uh, deep in opium, and he reads Ricardo's Principles of Political Economy, and it comes to him like a, a thunderstroke, that here is someone who's uh, managed to illuminate all the complexity of how capitalist economies work, uh, starting from some, as he puts it, a priori principles. And, you know, it wasn't just uh, De Quincey being a bit, uh, having consumed a bit too much opium, uh, he, he was right, and this is something that Marx also seizes on. Because what Ricardo does is to state the labor theory of value, in other words, the idea that value, that the exchange relations between commodities depend upon the amount of socially necessary labor that is produced, um, that is needed to, to, to produce them, so that commodities, all the complications for the exchange relations between uh, commodities and the fluctuations of their market prices are ultimately regulated by the processes of production through which labor is performed um, to, to, to make these different commodities. Ricardo comes up with a very clear and rigorous statement of the labor theory of value, and he insists that all the different complexities of capitalist society can be reduced to or understood in terms of the labor theory of value. And for Marx, this is an immense intellectual achievement. The problem is that Ricardo can't deliver what he promises. He can't explain all those complexities. And the most important example of this is the exchange between labor and capital. Because one of the things that Marx is the first to state rigorously is that in capitalism, it's not just that lots of stuff gets bought and sold, that things become commodities that are exchanged on the market, but that labor power, the ability to work, itself becomes, becomes a commodity. So if Ricardo is right, and the labor theory of value applies systematically to ca- capitalist eco- economies, then it must ex- apply to the exchange through which the, the worker sells his, well, I'm going to say his labor, or her labor, to the... To the, to the capitalist. But how does that work? If labor is the source of value, how can it be a commodity that is exchanged on the, on the market? There seems to be a logical contradiction there. And Ricardo's critics, the ultimate founders, the originators of what becomes the, the classical, uh, the neoclassical economic orthodoxy that reigns in our universities now, seized on that as a, as a criticism of Ricardo. Of Ricardo. 
uh, he can't explain in terms of his own theory this fundamental relationship between capital and 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 wage wage labor now um, and marx part of and of the how marx himself comes to to no as a point in advance of that the reason why ricardo finds it hard to resolve this question is because he accepts capitalism as natural in other words he sees the particular economic relationships of capitalism as somehow corresponding to to human human nature and therefore the in particular what marx will call the relations of exploitation that define capitalism um are for ricardo simply consequences of the of human human nature they're not things that can change change or vary and that means that ricardo can't look closely at the exchange between the worker and the capitalist because that's where exploitation is actually generated in in capitalism marx because marx sees capitalism as a historically contingent social system he can go beyond ricardo and he does so by saying i said it before it's not what ricardo himself says that what the worker sells to the capitalist is not the actual labor that he or she performs for the capitalist in creating value but his or her labor power his or her ability to 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 work um and what and but labor power as a commodity has a value just like any other commodity commodity which reflects the amount of labor that's required to reproduce the worker to feed and clothe and house etc etc the the worker so marx is able to integrate the labor theory of the uh, exchange between labor and capital within the labor theory theory of value um because he sees capitalism as a historically contingent and transient system that is founded upon the transformation of labor power into a commodity and of course in part 8 of capital volume volume 1 he shows the process of primitive accumulation or so-called primitive accumulation in which labor is labor power is transformed into a commodity by the peasants being driven off the land the the commons being seized so that the former peasantry can only survive by selling their labor power to capitalists labor power being a commodity is a result of a process of historical transformation it's not it's not natural but in overcoming ricardo hegel uh, marx needs hegel because ricardo has a method which involves stating the labor theory of value and then just juxtaposing to it all the different co- concrete phenomena of ca- capitalist society and trying i mean i'm being slightly unfair to ricardo trying to bend or 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 push all these concrete pho- phenomena into the into the labor theory of value hegel has a has a method which marx takes over and um uses to overcome the limitations of ricardo because um um there's a famous uh, passage in the introduction to the grundrisse which marx wrote at the very start of all this in 1857 which talks about the moving from the abstract to the concrete uh in other words to understand capitalist society you move step by step from looking at the most abstract and general features of capitalism and then once you've grasped those to fit all the more concrete elements of capitalist society into an overall understanding of capitalist society as a whole where he gets that that method is from hegel in hegel's sense of logic you have a very complex set of categories that are introduced step by step and each category is derived from the previous one and it starts from the most abstract category of all the concept of being and it ends up um with uh, a a category the category of the absolute idea unfortunately um which is the the category which cl- um integrates within itself all the different complex aspects of of reality so you have this movement from a very ab- the most abstract ca- category to one that hegel believes grasps the whole com- all the complexity of reality now 
this is where I get, get a bit nervous because um, once you start talking about Hegel, um, then everything becomes quite obscure, partly because Hegel uses an obscure language, but partly because, as Marx criticises him, he is an idealist philosopher um, who believes that thought in some ways generates the, the world, um, and Marx is a materialist who believes the opposite, that in some sense thought reflects and is dependent upon the world. So there's this very complex operation where Marx appropriates Hegel and uses him to criticise and transcend Ricardo, but in the process also goes beyond, goes beyond Hegel himself. I don't want to say much more about that. Um, I would like to say that the book, part of the book that I'm most nervous about are the two chapters on method, respectively on Ricardo and Hegel, because I know, not so much because of Ricardo, but because, that it, because of Hegel, those are the most difficult parts of the book. Um, and I apologise for that, but really it's impossible to properly to understand uh, what Marx is doing in Capital unless you discuss Hegel. I mean, Lenin recognised this when he read... Hegel's logic uh, during the First World War, he said, you can't understand Marx's capital without also having read and understood Hegel's logic. Maybe a slightly extreme statement, but there is an interdependence between the two. The interdependence is complicated, though, because Marx uses Hegel, but goes beyond, beyond him. And one of the main things in the book that I try to do is to show that there are people who argue that Marx the whole structure of Marx's capital is somehow derived from or mirrors Hegel's logic, and I try to show how this is completely false and that Marx has a much more pragmatic relationship to Hegel. He takes him and uses him and then abandons him, which isn't very nice, but works. <laughs> um, okay, so what does all this talk about method do in terms of helping us to understand the workings of, of capitalism? Um, how, how does it uh, help us understand those workings? Um, well, I'll give, a, give an example. Um, I've been a bit defensive about the discussion of Hegel, but the chapter that I feel happiest with is chapter six, uh, the last substantial chapter, which is about Marx's understanding of crises. Because, of course, one of the ways in which Marx goes beyond conventional bourgeois thinking is that he sees crises not as a kind of accident, as something that happens when something goes wrong in capitalism, the institutions are badly run, or you have the wrong people in charge. Crises are inherent in the operation of the system. And of course, that's an idea that mainstream bourgeois thought, particularly mainstream economic orthodoxy, finds very, very hard to understand or to, to, to accept, which is why the crisis of 2007 8, 9 came as such an immense shock uh, to, the, to the economics pr profession. And it's quite interesting. Piketty, although he's uh, a more critical bourgeois economist, he still, uh, in this respect, in not seeing crises as imminent to, inherent in the operation of capitalism, is very much a mainstream, mainstream bourgeois, bourgeois thinker. And what Marx... But Marx, so Marx is very preoccupied with understanding uh, where capitalist crises come from. And when he first uh, starts developing his critique of political economy in the late 1850s, he develops this plan for a um, very ambitious plan which in, for his work, which in, involves six volumes, the final of which was going to be on the world market and, cr and crises. Now, he never actually succeeds in doing that, um, like I said, he never manages to finish anything. But in, in Capital itself, you find quite a lot, uh, quite some of the major elements of um, a very profound and complex understanding of crises. Why are crises so important to Marx? Not because he thinks an economic crisis is going to mean the end of capitalism. He never says anything like that, contrary to his caricaturers. But because he sees in economic crises, as he puts it somewhere, the summation the con concentration, he says elsewhere, of all the contradictions of capitalism as an economic system. So if you want fully to understand the nature of capitalism and its limits, you have to understand crises. And 
this, this method that I described of moving from the abstract to the concrete, progressively introducing more complex determinations of capitalism as a system, informs his treatment of, of crises in capital. So in volume one of Capital, uh, crises appear in two ways. First of all, um, he shows that crises are inherent in the commodity relationship. The commodity relationship is you have a commodity, you exchange it for money, and if things go the way they're supposed to, you then use the money to buy another commodity. But Marx points out, nothing forces you, once you've got the money, once you've exchanged your commodity for, for money, to actually go on and buy another commodity. Um, so the whole process can stop at that point. You can hoard the money. You can hang on to it. This is something that Keynes also later put a lot of emphasis on. If enough people don't spend the money they get from selling commodities, then that in itself can produce a, a crisis in the system. So the, crisis, the possibility of crises are built into the commodity relationship itself. But Marx says this is an abstract possibility. Later on in Capital, which is mainly about the exploitation of workers in production, he lays an important basis for understanding why crises are cyclical. Bourgeois economists talk about the business cycle. Crises are something that come regularly every so, so many years in the course of the history of capitalism as an e econo economic sy system. Why is capitalism cyclical? One reason, Marx argues, is because of the Industrial Reserve Army. He argues that capitalism is very technologically dynamic. Um, that means that uh, un it constant, it's constantly competition forces capitalists to increase um, productivity. When they increase, increasing productivity means that you can produce the same amount of stuff with fewer workers. Workers lose their jobs. That leads to the growth of what he calls the Industrial Reserve Army of Labour. This puts pressure on the workers who've still got jobs, but the, the size of the Industrial Reserve Army uh, fluctuates uh, over time. When the system is growing fast and the rate of accumulation is high, the Industrial Reserve Army shrinks. As that happens, unemployment falls, workers' bargaining power increases, they press for higher wages, and that over time pushes, cuts into profits and leads to a, a reaction um, by the, the bosses that leads to the slowing down of accumulation and a movement in the, in the direction of crises. So that's another element of Marx's theory of crises. But skipping forward, it's in volume three that we have his decisive development of his theory of crises, where he sets out his fame in part three of Capital, volume um, three, his famous theory of the uh, tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which is to do with how the pr this pressure of competition leads capitalists, as I said, to raise productivity, and that leads to an increasing mass of capital invested relative to each, each worker, but it's the workers who produce the surplus value, the profits, uh, the surplus value that is itself the source of the profits that fuel the whole, whole system. So there's this much deeper tendency of the rate of profit to fall than the, the one produced by the fluctuations in the size of the Industrial Reserve Army. But this, the crises that are produced by the falling rate of profit don't lead to simply the disintegration of capitalism so long as capital is destroyed, so long as inefficient firms are wiped out and the more profitable firms are able to take over their assets and improve their profitability. This is a deeper explanation of why capitalism is cyclical. But the final element I just want to mention in Marx's theory of crises is where in part five of Capital Volume 3, he talks about the credit system, which is what we call financial markets today, and he shows how the fluctuations of uh, euphoria and panic that take place on the financial markets help to bring about this, uh, that help to... Um, drive the, um, the deeper processes invo involved in the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. When there's euphoria, there's more in investment, the system expands more rapidly. When there's panic, that leads to firms going bankrupt, capital being destroyed, wiped out of the system, and, and, so, and so on. So 
Marx actually has a very complex, multidimensional theory of crisis, which is very helpful in understanding the crisis today. Because if we want to understand the crisis today, we have to look at the long-term tendency of the rate of profit to fall that people like Michael Roberts have shown um, is very much at work today. But we also have to look at how that is manifested, how that tendency is manifested and partly blunted and partly accelerated by what happens on financial markets. <coughs> this brings me to my final point. I said that the main point that I wanted get, to get over in my book was understanding that, an understanding that capital is a relation. Marx, in fact, sees capital at the core of the capitalist system as defined by two crucial relationships. One is the relationship, the, the more fundamental is that between capital and wage labor, the antagonism between capitalist and worker that defines the exploitative ca character of ca capitalism as a system. But there's a second, less important, but still very important um, an, a, a relationship, which is that between capitals themselves. Marx says capital can only exist as many capitals. There's no, capital isn't a single unified blob battening off the working class. It's a plurality of rival capitals competing with each other. And this competition is crucial to understanding why there's, for example, a tendency of the rate of profit, profit to fall. And you have to understand the nature and interaction of these relationships if you want to understand the dynamic of capitalism as a system. Now, this is a crucial insight, and it's something, I don't have time to talk about it, but if you look at even some of the best work by contemporary Marxist commentators on capital, including, at, at times, David Harvey, it's an insight that isn't um, fully, fully grasped and applied to the world today. There's too strong a tendency to see capital as, capital as something external, that something parasitic that just comes and battens off people's creativity and natural resources and, and so on. And this leads to a misunderstanding, of, of an underestimation of the power and dynamism of capitalism, which we can see very clearly in how its industrial capitalism has conquered East Asia over the last generation. But it also leads us to underestimate its weakness, because at the heart of capital is the relationship between capital and wage labor. And that is one of interdependence. The, the worker needs the capitalist for, the jo for a job, but the capitalist needs the worker in order to create the value from which the capitalist profits come from. And when the, worker, um, when the workers realize the capitalist dependence on them and get together and act co collectively, that's the beginning of the end of the system. And it's towards that end that all of Marx's work is written. Tom Asham, uh, one of the journalists on Socialist Worker. I think um, the question of inequality has always been important uh, for the left, but because of um, the impact of austerity and also the movements against it, we can see that it's becoming increasingly, important, uh, increasingly um, an important topic of debate. And I think that's one of the reasons that um, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, has been greeted with such acclaim and such, um, such fuss on the left. Um, and in some ways, I think it's quite welcome in the sense that it does present uh, an attempt to return to a political economy in some ways. I mean, he talks about that we need to get away from simply abstract mathematical models. And what he, wants, he says he wants to do is um, discover a, a, new a new framework which looks at the underlying mechanisms behind the distribution of wealth um, and income inequality. And certainly the fact that he's focusing on on wealth as opposed to just income inequality is also important because the level to which wealth is concentrated within a society impacts on how income is distributed. Though I think there are still a number of problems and I think this comes down to really his, his definition of capital because what he does, he conflates capital simply with national wealth. He says it's simply the, the sum total of market value of, of all assets and commodities that, are, that can be sold on the market at any given point in time. And what this means, he attaches particular importance to the question of housing, housing as well, and therefore he doesn't really grasp the underlying processes uh, within 
within capitalism. So, for example, this leads him to dismiss um, uh, key Marxist concepts such as um, the tendency of profit to fall, which he says has been historically proven uh, to be inaccurate. Um, now, this, this doesn't only come from the fact that that he doesn't sort of understand uh, that his calculations about housing sort of distort some of that. It's also because um, when he sort of when he sort of he makes some basic um, errors when it comes to Marx, just saying that Marx believed in zero productivity growth, and that's why um, that, that's why um, uh, uh, the rate of profit would fall. And in fact, it's actually uh, increasing productivity within Marx that causes that. And Ricardo, in fact, quite ironically, who seems to be favoured by Piketty, argued that decreasing uh, productivity would, see a, would have an impact on, on, on the rate of profit. I just think, finally, just looking at, fun, when looking at Piketty, I think it's important to look at what he calls the, sort of the second fundamental law of capitalism. And he basically says that the, the reason for an increasing inequality of wealth within sort of the 21st century is uh, the guiding law here is that when the capital income ratio, that's basically the stock of capital to, to national income, is dictated by the savings rate and the growth rate. So when growth rate is low, savings rate is high, what happens then is you see an increase in income uh, and wealth inequality. And he says the reason for this is because we're seeing sluggish growth within the, we're going to be seeing sluggish growth within the 21st century. I think a lot of this would actually be helped if he, if he had accepted some of the sort of Marxist concepts, such as the tendency rate of profit to fall, which could explain why this sort of, that sort of sluggish, uh, sluggish growth within the economy as well. But most importantly, what he says is that when the rate of return on capital is exceeds the rate of growth. That's when you see this sort of uh, increase in inequality. The problem is that he doesn't. He says the rate of return on capital has been stable uh, basically from the 19th century onwards. And I think this is his sort of fundamental flaw here, underpinned by the fact that he doesn't. His definition of capital doesn't allow him to link it to the production process and the exploitation of workers. Uh, Green. Um. I'm not a member of the SWP, but I've always felt it very important to read the works of Alex Kalinikos. And having uh, read most of the recent book that he's just published, uh, it's confirmed me in just how important it is to read Alex Kalinikos. Um, I'd like to make two points. One is about Hegel, and one is about uh, the critique that uh, Alex gives of Moishe Postone, uh, which is only a short part of the book. But first of all, on Hegel, um, I've always thought it was important that Hegel uh, develops the idea of a, of a subject and the idea of a historical subject. Previous to Hegel, we just have from philosophers like Spinoza the idea of substance and the idea that there, is, there are movements through history, but they're not really conscious movements and they're not things that... Uh, conscious sections of, of human society can take control of and direct. But Hegel changes all of that through his concentration on history in, in his development of uh, the understanding of philosophy and also through the very disciplined way in which he looks at the advances that previous philosophers have made. Um, you know, and so that he gives a history of philosophy as well as uh, a straight history. Um, now, uh, this idea of a subject, a historical subject, I think is very important to the working class. Uh, my view is that philosophy and history are intimately connected, and the class struggle as well is, are intimately connected, and that it's very important that the working class sees itself as a historical subject. And for that reason, I see Hegel as a very important predecessor uh, uh, of Marx, and um, so I'm delighted at the attention that, he that uh, Alex is giving to Hegel uh, in this recent book. Um, and if anything, I wish that he'd given a little bit more attention. Um, now, the other thing is about Postone. Now, this man, Postone, wrote a book in 1993 called Time, Labour and Social Domination. And in it, he argues that a, the subject of history can only be capital, because capital is, for Postone, the dynamic force in history. Um, and so somehow we're going to be projected from where we are now to supposedly a better society because of the dynamism of capital. Now, this would have been utterly rejected by Marx, as Alex points out, because we are in, the, we are in a decaying, the decaying phase of capitalism. 
Marx says that capital was progressive when it initially came about, but it is now in a, a very rotten, decaying phase, which means that we've got to be dragged out of that by the working class. And the working class has to see itself as a subject. And it's been a real problem within uh, a academic Marxism that uh, academic Marxists have been disorientated by this, this book by Postone. And, we, and Alex gives some of the pointers of, of the, how we can start to see the working class as a subject when it struggles and when it struggles to learn from philosophy and history. And that's why Alex's critique of Postone is so important. Okay, before, before Brian speaks, we've got a question from Jerry McCabe. Um, I think I'm going to read the name out wrongly. I'm sorry. It says, can you clarify Hiller Tikkinen, sorry, Tikkinen's theory of, on the tendency for the rate of profit to fall? Sorry, I couldn't read that properly. Um, after Brian, it's um, Joseph Tunara. And just to clarify, when I tap the first time, it means you've got a minute left. And when I start angrily tapping, it means you need to stop because you've run out of your three minutes. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Brian Green, author of Planning the Future and collaborator with Bill, <coughs> Bill Jeffries on his book, which is about to be published in hardback and in softback on From Communism to Capitalism, Back to Communism, uh, sorry, Capitalism to Communism and Back to Capitalism which is an analysis of the Soviet Union and how the OECD, the IMF, and everybody got it wrong. Now, Alex, I've only read the last two chapters of your book, and from that I can see it is a worthwhile book. But what I don't understand, on page 297, you correctly and very elegantly identified... You shouldn't laugh because this question of state capitalism is about to be big time soon... Um, you actually very elegantly state the two dominant social relations in capitalism, the top of page 297, in which you say the separation of workers from the means of production and the competition of many capitals. And you conclude in your talk as well of talking about capitalism only functions as many capitals. And Marx is very explicit and very implicit. He says capital can only exist as many capitals. He rules out the concept of state capitalism. Why? Because the law of value can only exist as a result of those two separations that Alex has described. So what I'd like to know from Alex is having done all this wonderful research, having helped us understand the methodology of Marx, why do you still defend the theory of state capitalism? The second thing I want to say very quickly, you haven't tapped yet, um, is your six reasons for crisis. It's, it's, it's interesting, but you know, if Marx would have seen the data we have available to us today, he'd go, wow, obviously in German, but he'd go, wow. And what the data does show us is something you don't describe in your book, and that is what is happening to the surplus of society. And I think what Marx is moving towards is an examination of how the surplus of society is consumed. And the figures we have today, we know the multinationals are investing 39 cents in every dollar of free cash flow, compared to over 70 cents before 1973. We know that the top 0.1% are spending 1.7 cents in every dollar of extra wealth that they are sucking in, as opposed to 3.2 cents. So what is really happening in the world economy today is that a greater and greater um, portion of the surplus of society is taking the form of an idle hoard. And it's this which is fueling all the speculation we see. And as a doctor who can't see a virus but can see an antibody, it's very, very difficult to extract a, a functioning rate of profit. But from the fallout from the falling rate of profit, we can, we can say that the rate of profit is depressed in sections of the world economy and it's taking the form of the surplus of society not being spent. Thank you for keeping to time. Um, after Joseph, it's Sheila McGregor. To come back on what the previous speaker was saying, I mean, the existence of many capitals and competition between them isn't in contradiction to the theory of state capitalism. In a, re in a real sense, it's the whole point and the whole explanation of the theory of state capitalism. And let me try to explain why. You see, what Marx argues, and it comes across in some ways clearer in the Grundrisse uh, than in Capital, is that the pressure of capitals on one another forces capitalists to behave 
as, cap uh, as capitalists, to obey the laws of motion of capitalist society. Any capitalist who fails to exploit, to accumulate capital and so on, is quickly driven to the wall and driven into bankruptcy. Uh, it's competition that enforces the laws of motion of capital. What the theory of state capitalism is talking about is how this plays out on a world scale when you have countries like the Soviet Union, when the entirety of production is planned and run by a state bureaucracy. And the first thing to say about it is there's a broader tendency at work here within world capitalism at this time. If you look at many uh, economies, many economies in the 1920s, 30s, and particularly around the time of the Second World War, turn to some version of state capitalism. Where that's fully consummated in the Soviet Union and later the satellites in, in Eastern Europe, uh, what you have effectively is a state bureaucracy which plans production across the entire country as if the Soviet Union were one giant uh, factory. Where does competition come into this picture? It comes in because on a global scale, there's still intense imperialist and military competition between rival uh, state capitalist blocs on a global scale. And it's that pressure of that competition on a global scale that forces the Soviet Union to mirror in almost every aspect the horrors of capitalism in its Western free market version. And that's why the Soviet Union becomes a mirror image of Western capitalism, characterized by both the intense drive to accumulate and the exploitation uh, and alienation of the workers who live in that society. Just finally, I think it's a very important example of something that Alex talks about in his, in his excellent book. Uh, it's a way in which we uh, uh, take the method and the analysis of Marx and try to extend it to take into account more concrete developments and changes to the system uh, that have taken place since Mar Marx's lifetime. That was the project that the great generation of people around Lenin, Bukharin, Trotsky, Preobrazhinsky and so on did around the time of the First World War. But that project of extending and concretizing the categories of capital still continues today. Um, after Sheila, it's um, May Truong. Right, well, I haven't read your book yet, uh, Alex, so I've got that to, to look forward to. I, but what I did want to talk about is why uh, grappling with uh, Marx's theory of, uh, of exploitation and crisis is so fundamentally important for revolutionary socialists and for, for activists. And I just want to concretise that by... If we flip back to 1997 and the Labour government in power, what was the mantra we heard? It's funny to think about it now, but what was the constant mantra we heard from Gordon Brown as Chancellor of the Exchequer? It was precisely that uh, he had abolished crisis from, uh, from the system. And there were a huge number, well, huge numbers of people who wanted to believe that, who no doubt did believe that, and who were completely taken aback when the, uh, you know, when the, when the crisis finally hit in, uh, in, uh, in 2007, 2000, 2008. And therefore, through that period, I mean, one of the things about being a revolutionary socialist and actually do, having to, you know, struggle to read Capital or to read actually uh, Mar um, Marx's book, uh, Alex Galidikos's excellent book on um, an introduction to, to Karl Marx, I don't know whether it's here, which actually does go through, uh, go through the ideas, was absolutely fundamental for rooting an organisation like the SWP in an understanding that what Gordon Brown and the Labour government were saying was actually wrong, that the theory of crisis is actually inherent in, uh, in the system. But then, if you think about what has happened since then, we get the flip side to that, which is that because capitalist relations are natural, there is absolutely nothing that we can do about crisis except to swallow the austerity measures, which are the only solution. And it's again, if you only, if you, unless you have an understanding that this is a relationship, you know, the relationship between wage labour and capital, and that the working class is at the heart of uh, of, uh, of of uh, of producing its surplus, can you then deal with the argument that actually we should not pay for the crisis? And that is, I think, is fundamentally important for us, particularly for you know, when the moment when the struggle is beginning to rise again, and we are that, that argument in terms of motivating people to to fight that we should not be paying for the crisis. It is their crisis. It is inherent in. Their system and the only solution that they have is on the backs of trying to make us pay for it and a that means an increase in poverty on the one side and 
and, and wealth on the other. But as Joseph referred to at the end, the other consequence of competition between capitalisms is war and the devastation of war. And actually, if we are going to maintain that position, which you know, collapsed in 1914, that, the, uh, that, that the, your enemy is at home, is that your ruling class at, is at home and that your, fr- your friend is the international working class and you're going to stand up to imperialism, then actually having that understanding of how capitalism works and the consequences is absolutely crucial for us and is why we need to, you know, why we need to get our heads around the theory. I was, th- I was just thinking, if capital is about social relations, then we have to talk about society. But in a sense about the evolution of society and as such... I'd like to introduce the notion of, oh, well, I, I'm not really introducing it at all, but fate and destiny. I was just thinking, right, um, say in China at the moment, the uh, trade unions, uh, I, I don't mean the, the uh, official big governmental one, ones, one, but, but, but the uh, grassroots ones, and, and they, they have to um, deal with both the local level and the state level. Uh, the, the national level. So I, I was just thinking about the dynamics between, um, um, what, 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 what you call it, the, 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 the motor of, of history, a bit between the working class and, and capital, but between labor and, and the protests and, and the, the, the crying out for change and so on, and how that change is being brought about. And, and that leads me back to uh, the, uh, the, the system within uh, capital itself, w- w- which is amazing in the sense that it, it, it incorporates newness, things that, that haven't been brought into being before. Isn't that what history is about? And, uh, but, but as Hegel would say, you can't really talk about something unless you have the language for it. And, and, and how, how do we structure thought from experience, from, from grassroots, from people's lived experiences and, and that, that leads to the notion of pragmatism, pragmatism and openness but at the same time I, I really think that there is a consistency uh, that there's, it's not like all the variables have changed, all the factors have changed but it's the fact that how do we talk about some, it, it's, like, it's like how do we come up with new ways of doing the same thing things. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of ask, like, why, why does it matter that um, Alex has written this long, probably quite difficult book about, capitalism, about capital? Why does it matter that, that we try and sort of understand the system? And I think it matters really only in as much as... Um, it sort of shows us the weakness of the operation of the system in order to strategically respond to that. And I think some of the things that Alex was talking about in terms of looking at the, like the, the fundamental position of the relationship of exploitation and being able to talk about how that's, it's, it's not only central or a central relationship within capitalism, but it's vital to the continuation of capitalism is quite important at the moment to respond to some of the debates that we come up against among other people on the left in terms of trying to understand the system, trying to understand crisis. Theorists or people who follow theorists like Pollyani who see relationships of domination and things that potentially come from without or outside of the system. Because actually it matters in terms of how we try and and respond. Um, So if we think about some of the big debates we've been involved in in the last few years, things about what is the relationship of the social movement, how far can the social movements go in terms of fundamentally changing society. And I think the reason why this is so helpful, because on the one hand it talks about the fact that that... And, and of course, what's the role of the working class? That relationship of exploitation is absolutely central to the continuation of capital. It's not just about workers getting exploited. Capital relies on it to continue. And I think looking as well at the relationship between capitals tells us as well the system isn't just going to be harnessed. It's not just a situation where we can make capitalism a little bit nicer or, or put... put uh, grind it to a halt even, actually 
uh, the competition between capitalism creates a compulsion that means that the system will continue to draw us into these crises, continue to create all the human devastation that different people have spoken about until we're able to, to break those relations. Oh, that's fine. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Uh, someone asked, what, did, what, did I, what do I think of Hillel Tiktin's critique of the falling rate of profit? Um, I know and like Hillel Tiktin, but I know nothing about uh, his critique, so I can't say anything about it. Sorry. Um, one has to be honest ab about the extent of one's ignorance, and that, that's certainly part of it. On, on Brown's, um, uh, on Brown's uh, the point that Brown's made... I mean, Joseph has, has responded, but I should just say from a purely uh, autobiographical point of view that I only really came fully to understand the labour theory of value through understanding the theory of state capitalism, that I, I got a deeper understanding of, in particular, how what Marx calls the law of value works thanks to understanding the theory of state capitalism. The law of value is the, the, the pressure that different capitals put on each other through their constant competition. And it's this that, you know, when we talk about the labour theory of value and commodities uh, exchanging according to the socially necessary labour time required to produce them, uh, it's n that's not just something that's true by definition or something like that. It's because of the process of competition. The process of competition le forces firms to compare the labour that they squeeze out of workers in their individual units of production with the labour that's squeezed out of workers in their rivals' units, units of production. Think, for example, about the way in which there's this constant anxious chatter from employers that's used against us to get us to work harder about you know, how cheap and how hard-working uh, workers are in China or Vietnam or wherever. Stripping aside the ideology, that's about the law of value, the way in which this constant process of competition is equalising the amount of labour that is required to reduce commodities in different, different parts, of, parts of the world. And what um, the phenomenon of state, state capitalism, incidentally, I don't think it's true at all that Marx ruled it, denied that state capitalism could, could exist. Engels certainly is very clear that, that you could have the development of forms of state capitalism as, as capitalism became a more complex and an organized system and capital became more concentrated and centralized in the, in, the, in, the, in the course of time. The phenomenon of state capitalism forces one to state um, the law of value in somewhat more ab abstract terms and in particular to recognize that competition doesn't simply take the form of economic competition between firms, it also takes the form of geopolitical competition between states. And one of the crucial things about imperialism as an epoch is the way in which the pressures of geopolitical competition forces individual states to internalise the laws of capital accumu capitalist accumulation and, and exploitation within their own societies. State, what happens in Russia under Stalin, was an extreme development of a process that had been going on over a much longer period of time, not in Russia, incidentally, but uh, or, uh, um, uh, also in, uh, in other societies. And the imperative pressure of the law of value and the way in which it restructures economies and societies all, all the time is, if you like, the hidden truth of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is about stripping away all the institutional and social obstacles to the operation of the law of value. Now, they can't do that for all, all sorts of reasons, but that's what they aspire to, and that's what we have to resist. Um, Brown also talked about the, the fact that a lot of the surplus value that is extracted uh, isn't actually invested. That's true. I mean, there's this amazing figure that the top... In 2013, the top 2,000 global companies were sitting on $4.5 trillion that, they, that were just profits that they, uh, that they weren't invested. $4.5 trillion. You know, the next time any of our bosses says there isn't enough of money, money for this or that, tell him or her about those $4.5 trillion. But I think that that has to be understood 
and stood pre precisely in the context of the problems of profitability that capitalism uh, uh, faces. It's true that there's lots of greed and parasitism and all that sort of stuff, st stuff around, but fundamentally, firms aren't investing because they don't believe that the kind of returns they'll make on those investments justify the, uh, justify the investment, and so they sit on the money. That's about the falling rate of profit. The other point that... Um, that Phil raised about uh, Moishe Pastone is, is actually quite, a, quite an important one. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite a difficult book, actually. He says with relief, much more difficult than mine. <laughs> uh, um, Pastone's book. Um, but it actually states, he states, it's a very intelligent and um, erudite book, and it states with particular rigor and clarity a view that is quite common on the, on the left. Because what Pastone says is... Lukács was wrong to say that the working class is the subject of history, uh, the, or as Lukács put it in rather Hegelian language, the identical subject and object of history. The subject of history is capital. Um, that it's, it's, it's capital that is the kind of dynamic creative force that drives on, uh, on, on capitalist society. And the other side of the coin is that if capital isn't the subject of history, the working class is not, and is not in a very fundamental sense. For Postone, you can't talk about the working class emancipating themselves. The working class are in many sense a problem because they're so shaped by capitalist society that they're capable of rising above the, the kind of norms and patterns that we find in capitalist society. And this idea of capital as a subject is, is something that's been taken up by lots of contemporary interpreters of, of capital. And usually people aren't as explicit as Postone is and don't draw the conclusion that it's not just that capital is the subject of history, but the working class can't be the subject of, of history. But there's an implicit logic there that leads people um, to... Um, see in struggles at the margins of the system, for example, John Holloway in his last book, Crack Capitalism, to look at the, the kind of cracks and holes where people are somehow able temporarily to escape the pressure of capitalist exploitation, to see struggles at the margins as the real, the real centre of liberation. And I think this is completely wrong, that first of all, Marx does not see capital as a subject of history. There's a a certain amount of tedious scholarship that, through which I seek to, seek to prove this in terms of the manuscript. But more fundamentally, what capital is, what capital is, is, the sense, is this set of relationships that impose um, a set of impersonal pressures, crucially those to do with competition and accumulation, and all the different parts of the system. As I've said, this is at the heart of the, the, the law of value. But those pressures of exploitation and crisis and all, all that then produce a reaction from, from workers from which workers can, uh, can develop into a collective subject that can remake the world. There's a great... Um, there's a, the, the idea that capital is a, um, is a subject is an example of what Marx calls fetishism, giving things that are the product of human labour turning them into things that are, have a life, of, a life of their own. And there's a great passage in one of the manuscripts where Marx says the capitalists are at home in the kind of fetishized appearances of, of, capitali of capitalism, where it seems like capital, for example, is this creative force. But the workers, because of their position, resist these uh, appearances and are pushed into organizing against their exploiters. And that really is at the heart of Marx's understanding of capitalism, and that is a classic example of how relevant Marx is, is, is today. Because today we have, in extreme forms, the, the pressures to change and become more exploitable and accept more exploitation. And what we have to look to and build on are the, the, the points at which that pressure leads to organization and resistance because it's from that organization and resistance that we can get rid of the whole rotten affair. <laughs>